Hi, I'm Luke, the Hard Times Guy, and uh, what you're seeing is being recorded after I finished the video that you're about to see. Uh, this is the final video of a series I made uh, that I was calling Ankhalid and the F-Words. The F-Words were faith, family, and friends. And uh, when I conceived this idea and uh, committed to it and uh, previewed it before I started it, uh, to you, my viewers, I had no idea it was going to be as difficult for me to do as, as it was. Uh, and I had no idea that I was going to take as long doing it as I did. But it is what it is. Um, after I made it, I just there were things in it I just couldn't edit out. And there were things in it that made it all, uh, every episode, longer than I wanted it to be. And there were things that I intended to put in the episode uh, to keep it more in line with uh, what my uh, Hard Times Guy video started out to be. And uh, I, I just couldn't make any of that happen, and I couldn't make it happen in this last video either. So I'm giving you a heads up. If you're uh, a member of my family, then you're uh, going to probably want to hear what is in this video. If you're somebody looking for me to talk about uh, antiques and collectibles or hard times originals or some of the other things that I talked about in earlier videos, uh, you're not going to hear any or not very much of that in this last video. You're just going to hear a bunch of stuff about uh, me and uh, my faith and Aunt Colleen and her faith and uh, how I arrived at the things that I say in this video. So I'm just giving you a heads up. That's what it's going to be. It's probably going to be about 30 minutes long when I get on ed uh, editing it. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, we'll get back to the Hard Times Guy and the Hard Times Chronicles in episode uh, 15. But episode 14 is going to be about uh, my faith and my ankle's faith. And that's pretty much all you're going to get. I was uh, raised in a church. My mother and my grandmother, when I was a boy, took me uh, to church uh, just about every time the church was open. And that occurred from when I was as far back as I can remember as a boy until uh, the beginning of my teen years, I got to be uh, 13, 14 years old, uh, and I began to really get uh, a lot smarter than most of the adults in my uh, life, my realm, and I just began to know way more than they did about anything, including uh, going to church, so things started changing, and when I was uh, 15, uh, my mother uh, gave me the leeway to make some of my own choices and I started going to uh, a different church than the one she went to and she was going um, at that time to a different church than the one we were raised in as well I might mention that but uh, doesn't have really any real effect on what I was doing I I began going to uh, the First Baptist Church in the Bedford, which was a lot bigger church than what I've been uh, raised in. And uh, then when I got my driver's license, I got even more freedom. A lot of times I would go to Sunday school, and after I knew my mom was had left to go to her church, I'd skip the rest of it for that day and go down to uh, Lonnie's truck stop, eat biscuits and gravy, and then come home. But the, the fact of the matter is, for... Uh, several years I got away from my faith uh, and didn't go to church right from the time I was 16 until right around the time I was 30 I went uh, a lot of other places on Sunday besides church and then uh, I had uh, what I like to refer to as a prodigal son 
moment when I was about 30, 31 years old. Now, some of my family have heard this story. Others have never heard it probably because I don't like to talk about uh, too many things in my life or too many periods in my life where I was stupid. You know, my kids, I never let them hear stories about me being stupid if I can help it. And uh, I, I want all my children and my grandchildren to think that I am the wise old sage and I've always been. Every choice I ever made was a good one. And uh, that's why I can sit in judgment over the bad choices that they make. But there was a time in my life when I was making a lot of bad choices and I came to a, a spiritual awakening, so to speak. I was working second shift. I was, uh, had gotten off work at uh, midnight and uh, instead of going home, I went to a local bar and uh, I stayed there. Um, had a, had a few drinks and then there was a euchre game going on in the back room of this bar and it went on even after hours. So the bar closed and uh, the euchre game was still going on. I was hoping to get to play, but uh, I hadn't had an opportunity to get in the game yet. And uh, was watching this game and it was there was four people playing euchre and uh, I knew all of them. Uh, there were two spectators, I was one, and uh, another guy that uh, I knew was the other spectator. One of the guys playing was, he was probably the oldest guy in the group, and uh, he was drinking beer out of a quart bottle, and he had another quart bottle there that was uh, had been an empty, and he was uh, spitting his tobacco in that bottle. And, you know, 3, 3.30 in the morning, most of us had more to drink than we should have, and uh, he wasn't unlike that. He he was uh, fairly inebriated. And, uh, he picked up the wrong bottle and took a big swig of uh, that tobacco juice. And of course, it once he'd done that, it was too late to uh, correct anything. He coughed and choked and gagged, and black stuff come out of his nose, and tears come out of his eyes, and. Uh, that made a pretty uh, general mess of the area he was at on the, his side of the euchre table. And of course, everybody in the room uh, thought it was hilarious and everybody was having a good laugh. And I sat there and I was, I looked around at the people there. And by the way, all these people in this story uh, have passed on. They're all dead except me and uh, the guy that was sitting across the table from where I was, that who was the guy that owned the bar, he's still alive and he's heard this story before too. Uh, and he remembers the incident. And uh, I just looked and I, I sat there and I thought about the situation as it was. And I thought, you know, there's more uh, to life than this. I'm, I'm missing something. Here I am at 3.30 in the morning, uh, uh, sitting here with this group and, and uh, I like all these guys, but this is a pretty pathetic group, and this is a pretty pathetic way to live, and this is what I'm going to look like when I get to be an old man like him uh, if I don't do something different. And so uh, that got to me to thinking about what I could do and what I had done and where I had been and and what uh, I should be doing instead. And, and uh, I went from that evening uh, not, I mean, I didn't have a, 180 degree uh, crystal uh, revitalization moment, but I began to get back involved with the church and started going back to church and started taking my family to church and doing the things that I should have been doing for a long time. And uh, from that point until now, uh, I think I've been at a steady growth. So I would, my, what I would tell you now is that I'm a Christian man. I, I try to live a, a Christian life. I fail every day. I've had periods of failure in my life and people that uh, knew me, depending on when they knew me from, would uh, be surprised to say, to hear that uh, I 
try to live the life that I live now. Maybe some of them would. And some of them would be surprised to hear that uh, from that point until now, there was a period of time, maybe 20, 25 years, where I taught Sunday school. And uh, just a whole lot different from where I was for a, a specific time in my life when I was a young man. But my uh, faith is my faith. Uh, I know what I believe. Uh, I'm holding on to it. I'm not going to try to beat you over the head with it. I'll share it with you if you would like for me to, but uh, if you don't want nothing to do with it, then I'm not going to beat you over the head, be a Bible thumper, that, that type of a person. But I'm not going to let you ridicule me for my faith either. So uh, that's where I, that's kind of where I stand uh, with my faith and that's a short story of my history. And what I want to do is talk about Aunt Colleen and her faith. Before I do that, I have to tell you one other, I hope, short story about an individual who was a friend of mine for a lot of years, and I spent a lot of time with him. And I uh, spent uh, time out in uh, God's creation following bird dogs. He was my bird hunting buddy for years and years. So the last, his name was Morris Rogers. He uh, <clears throat> never was one to uh, spend any time in church. Uh, he didn't really have any use for uh, church and religion and religious people, as he called it. And uh, <clears throat> so religion to him was something that wasn't uh, a conversation that you would have with him. But I came to realize over a long period of time, and whenever you go to uh, make a 14 or 18 hour trip to Oklahoma uh, to hunt birds and and you, you make that trip out and you make it back, that's a long time to be in a truck with somebody. And we did that three or four times. Uh, and then every time we went bird hunting locally, you know, a lot, a lot of that times in a truck going here, or there, or yonder, uh, around southern Indiana hunting birds, and you just carry on a lot of conversations. Morse was a talker too, so I did a whole lot of listening and let, and let him do most of the talking. But certain things uh, come up, and so you get to maybe an insight into somebody that other people don't have when you spend that much time with somebody in uh, more or less solitary confinement. And Morse had a belief in God. It just wasn't uh, the same as what most people had. And he wasn't willing to talk to most people about it. In fact, uh, of the conversations that he and I had, he was the instigator of the conversation. And it was like he didn't ever state rules about when we're going to talk about this and how we're going to talk about it and what the rules are. But after a few times of... Uh, the, the door being opened to, for me to say what I thought or what I believed uh, and then having it abruptly shut and that was the end of it, uh, I began to understand how, how it was with Morris. He wanted to talk about it on his terms, uh, find out what it was that he wanted to find out, and then it was over. And so uh, that's how the conversations that I had with him go. Uh, went whenever it was anything about uh, my faith. And I began to learn through that experience. One, I learned uh, what Morse's unspoken rules were and what you could do and couldn't do. To And if you violated the rules, the conversation was over and he was tight jawed and that was the end of that. But I said all that to say this. Aunt Colleen was much that same way about her faith. Uh, and because of my uh, experience with Morris, I recognized some of those same things in her. And consequently, 
had opportunities, I think, uh, to hear what she had to say about her faith and uh, to inject things that I was thinking uh, and have her consider those and comment on those uh, in a way that wouldn't have ever been possible had I not uh, been Morris Rogers' friend because Aunt Colleen was much the same as he was when it came to talking about religion. Actually, when it came to, about, to going to church and talking about re religion, and she had the same uh, quotation marks in her tone of voice uh, when she said that word as Morris did. And uh, her uh, opinions and uh, feelings about so-called religious people uh, were much the same as his. And, and, having, known, and having known that, it, it just gave me uh, an opportunity to not uh, go places that I shouldn't go because it was going to end things right there and that was going to be the end of that discussion. Now I'm saying all this like I had a whole bunch of discussions with Aunt Colleen about religion and I did not. I can remember two uh, in particular, and probably there was two or three others, and some of them my mother was a participant in, and the, and some of them that she wasn't a participant in, but she uh, her influence in Aunt Colleen's life was uh, a part of uh, the conversation that Aunt Colleen and I were having. The first thing I want to say about that is uh, mother uh, was gone uh, before she was gone. In other words, when mother died, it had been some time a uh, period of months at least and maybe a year or more since she had was really there she her she had uh, dementia and uh, you couldn't have a conversation with her about things that you wished you could uh, she just was gone she couldn't uh, relate to things she couldn't put uh, complex thoughts and sentences together. And uh, I always felt like that most of the time uh, she knew who I was. But there were times when I realized that she didn't know who I was. She was talking to me and she thought I was my dad or she thought I was one of her brothers. And uh, she could, you know, fade in and out of things like that. And sometimes you just miss it in the conversation that you were trying to have with her. But I think I said it when I said she was gone before she was gone. And I think that probably before I ever had any kind of a conversation that concerned God with my Aunt Colleen, Mom was gone. She was already gone. She wasn't dead, but she wasn't able to converse on the same kind of level that uh, Aunt Colleen and I were conversing. And... Uh, the first time that happened, Mom was actually uh, in our presence, and Aunt Colleen was Aunt Colleen was a saint when it came to Mom. Her and Mom were close. And after uh, Mom got to where she was. Uh, Aunt Colleen helped me a great deal. Betty and I tried to keep Mom for a long time, not put her in a nursing home, but it got to where it was too much for us, and we ended up putting her in a nursing home. But during that time, and even during the time when uh, Mom was first in the nursing home and was able to get out and about, uh, Aunt Colleen a lot of times would tell me, go get your mom and bring her out here and uh, let her visit for a while or 
before mom was in the nursing home, Aunt Colleen said, bring your mom over and I'll keep her for a while and you and Betty can have a break. And sometimes she'd uh, keep her, you know, the rest of that day. Sometimes mom even stayed all night with her. And uh, so in that respect, uh, Aunt Colleen was a great help to me. And it also gave me a lot of opportunity to have conversations with Aunt Colleen that I wouldn't have had except for that. And we were having a conversation like that one time when she introduced a concept to me that uh, I've done a lot of thinking about uh, since, and it has broadened my uh, spiritual experience a great deal. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the words were, but we were talking about my grandfather, and I was talking about, uh, she was talking about seeing him in heaven. And I was struggling with the fact that his uh, manner of speaking uh, included certain profanity that always made me flinch. He used God's name in vain, and, and that's about all he, as far as profanity, he, he wasn't vulgar and uh, gross like a lot of profanity is today, but when he did uh, get aggravated to the point that he used profanity, his his uh, chief uh, way of doing that was to use God's name, and and uh, I, it always made me uncomfortable. And I mentioned that to Aunt Colleen, and I had uh, you know I had trouble uh, in my thinking uh, correlating those two things: seeing my grandfather in heaven. And uh, the fact that he did that so frequently. And Aunt Colleen said to me, she said, I've had this discussion with her and nodded at my mother. And of course, my mother, she's just sitting over there smiling. She doesn't know what's going on, but... Uh, and she said, and then she went off on the side. She said, your mother, she said, Luke, you're a smart uh, boy. Aunt Colleen was talking about mom and how she was uh, smart, but not near as smart as she thought she was. She said, she always thought that she was smarter than me and smarter than Dot. Then she kind of laughed. She said she was smart and dot. She, uh, she said, Luke, you and your mother both uh, are missing out on how big God is. And she didn't mean my mother was missing out now. She meant in prior conversations that her and mom had had, uh, God was way bigger uh, than we allowed him to be. In Aquiline's mind, uh, people, and especially religious people, uh, put uh, God in a, a package that they could understand and uh, feel like they knew what was going on. And she, her contention was that God was way bigger than that. In fact, if God wasn't way bigger than that, she didn't have any use for him. And uh, when I tried to uh, discuss this with her or uh, bring her to understand my viewpoint, of God, then I got in that place where I was about to lose her. It was about to be over. We weren't going to talk about this anymore. So uh, I realized that and I just let her go. And she uh, caused me to rethink uh, a lot of thoughts that I had. Uh, one of the things that she said was when preachers tell you that God can move mountains. She said, they don't believe it. They read it and they say it and they don't believe it. 
And she said, when you get to the point where you believe it, where even though there's no record of God ever having moved a mountain, if he wants to, he can. And uh, someday he maybe will. And uh, she said, that's just, a, and that in a, in of itself is just a little bitty thing. She said, God is bigger than human beings can even imagine. And she said, you need to get to the place where you understand uh, at least that you don't understand. And uh, <clears throat> I will say that she has caused me to try to get to that place. And uh, since we had those conversations, and I'm going to tell you about a different, the, another conversation and her example in that other conversation here in a minute. But since we had that conversation that day and, and, and another conversation, uh, it has change my spiritual perspective to the place where I'm trying to get where she was to understand just how big God is and to understand that we don't know we can't possibly know and and the place that we put God in our minds is uh, minuscule compared uh, to where and what God actually is another or other, one of her other arguments that she gave me and this is kind of humorous, uh, but it, because I had had similar thoughts to it, I was able to grasp what she was saying and, and uh, take it more seriously than I would have. And uh, this is one where she said, Luke, now you're not going to hear this from any preacher. They're not going to tell you what I'm about to tell you. But she said, here's a way that you can think about God and maybe uh, get a better grasp on how big God really is. She said, David was an SOB. And uh, I said, David? She said, yes, King David. You know, little David with the slingshot grew up to be the king. He was an SOB. She said, in my mind, I would have no use for that man at all. And uh, I thought about what she was saying and I said, because, and she said, you know why because? He was a murderer, he was an adulterer, he was a liar. She said, I, I just don't have any use for him at all. Yet the Bible's clear on what God thought of him. So she said, God is way bigger than me. And, uh, I can't even conceive of uh, seeing somebody like him, like God saw him, yet it's clear how God saw him. And I'd had those same kind of thoughts about, not that David was an SOB, but that David had uh, things in his life that God saw past uh, when he looked at his heart. And so, that was another place where uh, Aunt Colleen's way of thinking and her uh, insistence that God was way bigger than I was perceiving him to be uh, helped me, I think, to grow. And uh, it helped me to understand that although God's, uh, the God that Aunt Colleen knew uh, was not one uh, that most people I got spiritual guidance from uh, even thought about, that she knew the same God I knew. Uh, she just knew him in her way, in a way that worked for her. And because that God is so big, uh, I'm okay with that now. And at a time when I wouldn't have been. A lot of people were looking at Colleen and, Think the same thing that a lot of people would have thought about Morris. Uh, didn't have much of a spiritual life, didn't think too much about God, but Aunt Colleen was in contact with the God that she knew, and uh, she helped me get in better contact with the, the God that we both knew.
I know this has been a whole lot different than most of my videos and uh, if you're still sitting here listening to me and you're not a member of my family uh, I appreciate it I think next time we'll get back on track I got a, a lot of footage shot of other things more things like what we started out with with uh, uh, antiques and collectibles and that kind of a thing and uh, we'll try to get back to that in my next video until then thank you